I, I want to just begin by um, sharing with you all how exciting and encouraging this week has been for us as a staff here at FBCG. Um, in addition to all of the work and preparation that goes into a fall launch and all the programs that are getting started and, and leaders who are being trained and, and children's ministry staff being equipped and all of that, um, we also have the excitement and the enthusiasm as a result of the annual meeting that I referred to um, just a bit earlier. And, and just the sense of overwhelming support that we feel as a church and from the church behind this vision that, that we believe God has placed in our hearts and in the hearts of our leadership to be a, a, a family of neighborhood churches who are, are committed to transforming lives and impacting the world through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, a, as I mentioned earlier, um, the vote on the merger with Faith Baptist Church of Mill Creek and subsequently the vote to fund the work that needs to be done over there and some other efforts here on this campus and on our West Campus um, passed in, in, in a pretty, pretty overwhelmingly supportive way. And, and just this sense of God working and moving. And there was this great sense of celebration on Sunday. And I think Pastor Jeff said uh, he was so encouraged and, um, on, on Sunday and woke up on Monday saying, we've got a lot to do. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's true. And we are looking forward to all that God has in store for us. And this, this entire vision, all that we believe God is leading us to, it's rooted in these words of Jesus from Matthew chapter 22 when, when he's asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus responds and says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. As Jeff said last week, it's really kind of two sides of the same coin. Jesus is saying that all of the law and the prophets, everything leads up to, it's summed up by these two commandments. Love God with everything that you have, and love your neighbor. And we want, as a church, to be about those things. We want to do that well. We're in a three-week series entitled The Art of Neighboring, looking at this call to love our neighbors. And specifically asking ourselves the question, how do we do this? Like to become practical about it. To, to look at and explore both as a church, but I think even more so for all of us, for each one, how, how do we as the people of God love those around us? How do we do that with our neighbors? We want to take this and think about this. We want to take it from the abstract. I think most of us would hear those words and we would affirm that idea. But we want to think about it in concrete, actionable ways. From, from a big idea to something that motivates us at our core to think about how I relate to and how I reach out to the people that God has placed around me in my life, in my sphere of influence, the people that I interact with every day. Last week, Pastor Jeff introduced this series as he talked about what we call the art of praying from Matthew chapter 9 where Jesus is looking at and interacting this, sees these crowds of people that are surrounding him, and his heart is moved with compassion. He says to his disciples, he says, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. This is this, is this reflection of the heart of Jesus for his people. This week, we're going to continue to look at this question, how do, we, how do we love our neighbors? What does this look like? And, and we're going to look at it from the perspective of or what we're referring to as the art of welcoming. We're going to look at this through a familiar encounter that, that many of us may have seen before, but maybe take a bit of a different perspective on it as Jesus meets and interacts and talks with the tax collector by the name of Zacchaeus. If you have your Bibles with you this evening, let's turn to Luke chapter 19. Luke 19, verses 
1 through 10. This is, this is Jesus' interaction with this tax collector, um, Zacchaeus. It says that he entered Jericho and was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone into the house to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of the goods I give to the poor, for, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come into this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Typically, I think, more often than not, when we look at the example or the passage and the story, this interaction between Zacchaeus and Jesus, we, we primarily consider it or think about it from the perspective of Zacchaeus and how he responds to Jesus. And, and rightly so. I think there's a, an incredibly powerful picture that unfolds in this text of somebody who, is, who encounters grace and who is changed by the gospel, and who responds in repentance to all that is Jesus Christ. It's the outworking of the gospel taking place. It's all there in, in, in these ten verses. And typically when we think about and look at this passage, that's kind of the message or the perspective that, that we look at it from. But for our purposes here today, I want us to think about this interaction and this conversation from the perspective of Jesus. And how he engages, how he welcomes, how he initiates this relationship with Zacchaeus. And to look at the implications of Jesus' actions here for us as we relate to our neighbors. What does this look like in the context of our relationships? And how do we live this out? And there's really two primary questions that I want us to consider here together. The first is, what did Jesus see and the second is, what did Jesus do? do you, if you were here last week, Jeff used kind of a, a similar sort of method to approach that passage in, in Matthew chapter 9 when he talked about uh, what did Jesus see, what did Jesus feel. And so we're going to kind of take a similar approach here, but let's begin with this first question. Simply put, what did Jesus see? When, he, when, inter, when Zacchaeus interacts with Jesus, what is it that Jesus is seeing? What is he observing in that place? And I think to really look at that question, we first have to understand and think about what everyone else saw, what they are seeing in that moment. Just for a bit of context here, we know from the text that Zacchaeus is a tax collector in the city of Jericho. Jericho is, is a wealthy city in an important location. Um, uh, Josephus, who is a Jewish historian, refers to Jericho as a divine region, the fattest in Palestine. So the, it was this, sort of this opulence and wealth that surrounded Jericho. Jericho, it, like the entire region, is under the rule and the reign of the Roman Empire. So they would require these heavy taxes on the people, on the citizens, in order to maintain and grow their ever-expanding empire. In order to keep doing what it is they were doing, they would tax their citizens. To accomplish this, Rome would then employ these, these regional tax collectors who were backed by the Roman military in order to handle the logistics of, of making the collection from the people, of receiving these funds. Tax collectors then, in turn, would they would charge a, a surplus on top of what Rome was collecting from the people. And again, they're backed by the military, so they give a cut to the military for sort of strong-arming people, and then they would become exorbitantly wealthy off the difference. Um, and there was, based on what we can see historically, very little sort of 
guidance or supervision or limits to the extortion and abuse that, that often took place. Worst of all, Zacchaeus and many other tax collectors were themselves Jewish. So the perspective or the view that people had was that they, these were men who had sold out to Rome. That they were taking advantage of, of Rome's occupation of, of, of Israel in order to line their own pockets, in order to, to provide for themselves. So Zacchaeus and tax collectors like him were considered traitors to their people. They were, they were not highly esteemed. And the text even says that Zacchaeus is a chief tax collector. So he has sort of elevated himself through the ranks where, where he's probably overseeing a region. He probably has has tax collectors working underneath him who are taking their cut, and he's taking a larger cut on that. And all of that to say that Zacchaeus, if if we were to run across Zacchaeus on the street, this is not a guy who's well-liked. This is not a guy who is well-received in his own community because he has sold them out. As if all of that isn't enough, then, the text says, because Zacchaeus is a short guy, that he is climbing a tree in order to get a view of Jesus. Again, something culturally can be lost here for us. We might think it odd if we saw an adult man climbing a tree, but I'm not sure it would strike us. In, in that culture, this is incredibly undignified. Like to the point, it's like you're, you, they would see you're like acting like a child. Um, an adult male would never be found climbing a tree. So here is a man who is despised among his own people and acting like a child. He has profited by taking advantage of those around them. He is a rich thief. And he's acting like a small child. And now Jesus, in this moment, steps in to engage, to welcome, to build a relationship with Zacchaeus. Because Jesus sees something more. There's more. He is aware of more here than what the crowds, and I dare say probably you and I, if we're there in that moment, see in Zacchaeus. I think there's a couple things that I want to point out here. But first, what, what emerges as I look at this passage is that Jesus is aware of his need. Jesus sees his need. The text indicates that that Jesus is surrounded by the crowds. So much so that Zacchaeus can't even get a view of Jesus without without doing something entirely undignified. And Jesus, in the midst of all of this, he stops to engage with Zacchaeus. Why does he do that? I think in the text here, when we see Zacchaeus' determination to see Jesus... It is a reflection of his desperation. Zacchaeus is willing to humiliate himself just to get a glimpse. Just to get a glimpse of who Jesus is and what it is that he's doing. And Jesus sees this in this moment and he responds and he stops and he speaks to Zacchaeus personally. The need of Zacchaeus is defined later on in the text in verse 10. Jesus is describing all that is taking place in his own purpose for being there. He's saying, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Lost was his condition. This is, this is his need. And I think the point here is I process this for myself. As I process the implications of this, as I relate to my own neighbors and my friends, the people that God places in my sphere of influence, is in order for me to share the heart of Jesus as it relates to my neighbor, I first have to become aware of their need. I need to see before I can engage. Before I welcome in, before I build relationship, I need to see what it is that Jesus sees. I need to look beyond what what sort of stereotypes or labels or, or impressions that we typically place on people. I do this all the time. Uh, This is convicting for me as I think about 
how I oftentimes approach, understand, think about people and, and the way that Jesus does this here. I need to see with the eyes of Jesus in order to have a heart moved, driven by the things that drove him. In order for me to have compassion on the people God has placed in my life, I need to see what Jesus sees. I remember um, a few years ago, I'm, I'm a sports fan, and so as a result, much to the annoyance of my wife, I listen in the car to copious amounts of sports radio. Um, and, and that is probably not the best use of my time. But there is one particular person who will go unnamed. He's on this station, and, I, and I'm not going to mention him, but he has got a horrible disposition on life view of things and I just re- I would I would oftentimes just turn to a different station or whenever this guy would come just, he's just vindictive and angry and cruel and just like I, I had a hard time listening to him and, on, and a friend of mine who's also into sports and also um, would sometimes listen to sports radio this conversation came up and he said you know I pray for that guy and I just thought wow I, d- I don't um <laughs> But I was convicted in that moment, like his awareness, his sense that that man's actions were flowing out of his brokenness and that what he needs, like he got it. I didn't get it. I didn't get it in that moment, but he got it. But I remember being that was the right response. He saw something that Jesus would see in that moment and he responded by saying, this guy needs somebody to be praying for him. And, and hearing the vindictiveness and the anger and all that sort of comes out it's like wow this guy needs jesus he could see the need just like jesus sees it here with zacchaeus additionally then i think i think what jesus sees in zacchaeus is he sees his worth he sees his worth and i know that this is an entirely human sort of way of thinking about things here um but this is a ginormous pr mistake for jesus to stop on the street and to engage with Zacchaeus is is a huge public relations mistake because Zacchaeus is despised he is ridiculed among his people to acknowledge and to respond to him as the person who has sold out to Rome who has grown rich from taxing and stealing from everyone that surrounds them in this crowd this this doesn't go over well You can see there in the passage, the people are angry that Jesus is going to go meet with and spend time with Zacchaeus. So why does why does Jesus do this? I was thinking about this again as we relate this to this neighborhood vision, but this call to reach our friends and our families and our communities with the gospel, to serve them, to build genuine relationships with them, this will include with it there is an inherent risk that comes alongside this meaning that if we are going to be willing to do this and and by that i mean me this includes me then i have to believe that the risk is worth it that i have to understand what's at stake jesus sees more in zacchaeus than what everyone else saw jesus sees the worth of a man who has been created with eternal value by the Almighty God. That he was more than the sum of his decisions and mistakes. Jesus saw his worth that that God had embedded in him as an image bearer. And because Jesus saw all of this, because he understood this, it was worth the risk to engage in this conversation, this this transformative interaction with Zacchaeus. I, uh, um, many years ago, was on a short-term trip with our students down in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. We would go to these feeding centers in the barrios, these these neighborhoods where there was abject poverty, the kind that that I have rarely seen in my life. Um, and, And these local Mexican pastors would would plant these feeding centers where the kids could come during the day and receive um, one very basic, very simple meal, and then there would be some programming and, and some, uh, like a VBS kind of study and support and encouragement for these kids. And, and this one particular pastor who is in one of the poorest of the poor neighborhoods um, was constantly having 
his home, which his home would would look like maybe the size of a garden shed, probably smaller, and had a cot, uh, a few belongings, and, and that's about it. And really looked like it needed to be torn down. And, and in all of this, he is doing this ministry out of this incredible place, but he has no fence around this, this feeding center. Um, and so we as the team, we start building this fence there, and the kids are running around, and they're playing, and, and they're doing the VBS program, and the pastor comes up alongside of me and he puts his arm around me and he says to me what do you see which I always hate these moments because I never get the rhetorical questions I never get those right <laughs> and I I look around you know and I say well I see the kids like I see the Nino it's like you know and he goes progress I see progress I see steps forward and I'm looking and I'm like this is progress like, there's garbage everywhere there's, there's, there's a dilapidated fence that high school students assembled and was doing the job, but none, we would look at culturally that this place needs to be bulldozed, and he's so encouraged how this is going to advance the work of the gospel in that neighborhood. And I was reminded, I have to enter into his world to see what he sees. In order for that to look like progress, I have to become, I have to walk alongside of him long enough to see the worth and the value in those people, those kids that he is reaching out to, in order to look at all of this and say, look at the progress. Look what he's doing here. See, Jesus saw the worth in Zacchaeus. He saw something that nobody else Saul, and as a result, he looks at Zacchaeus and he says, Zacchaeus, come down from there. Which brings us then to our second question. What, what is it that Jesus does here? What is it that he does? Again, a couple things that I just I want to point out real quickly here. But the first is Jesus extends an invitation. He says to Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. Jesus initiates a relationship with Zacchaeus by simply extending an invitation. Join me here in this place. And I don't want to overcomplicate this because I don't, I don't think it is complicated. The art of welcoming begins with an invitation into relationship. It begins with seeing the people around us, seeing the, the need and, and the worth and, and initiating a relationship with them. When God opens my eyes to see the things that he sees, to, to become aware of the need and to understand the immense value and worth that God has placed in that individual, then I can respond by initiating, by beginning, by starting a relationship, building a friendship. You see, you can't be a good neighbor from a distance. I can't love my neighbor from a distance. Jesus looks at Zacchaeus and he says, Zacchaeus, hurry, join me here, join me in this place. And as he does that, as he initiates this relationship, then Jesus does something I think so incredible and so powerful, is that he joins Zacchaeus. He joins him. Did you notice this in the text? Jesus does something remarkable here. He invites himself now over to the home of Zacchaeus. And Jesus could have easily done this all on neutral ground, right? Let's, let's go sit outside the synagogue. Or come, come with me to this home that, that me and my disciples are staying at here in, in the region. But Jesus doesn't do that. He joins him in the home of, he joins him in Zacchaeus' home. And I don't know that I've ever previously considered the significance of what Jesus is modeling to us here. In that culture, there is no greater symbol of, of acceptance than to sit down with somebody for a meal in their home. This is why there's so much outrage at what Jesus is doing here in the text. There's this negative reaction from the crowd. They're at shock that Jesus would associate himself with someone like Zacchaeus. I think once again here, Jesus is modeling to us. He is showing us something. Whereas this, 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 as this transformation is taking place, as all of this is unfolding, he models to us how the gospel meets us in this place. And this is so important because for me to understand, for me to see and be aware of the need that other people have, I can't lose sight of the need that I had and how Jesus met me there. 
I, I, can't, I can't lose sight of the reality that Jesus met me in that place and that he invited me into a relationship with him, that he welcomed me in there. Jesus demonstrates once again his capacity and his ability to overcome every obstacle that surrounds him in order to pursue Zacchaeus. He saw something that we didn't see, and that's what drove him to do what it is that he does. He looks at Zacchaeus, and he invites him into a relationship with him. He invites him to be a part of of what God is doing. And then he joins him at the place that he is. And maybe for us culturally, I think I think and when I think about how this looks for us as the church, yes, sometimes for us it means, hey, would you come come to worship service with me? Come join me at this thing that that we're doing. Come be a part of what's happening at FBCG. I think you're gonna love it. I think and we do that all the time. We 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 have programs throughout our church where we encourage you to invite people in that are designed for that sort of thing. But I think when we look at what Jesus does here and we take it seriously, it also means for us, can I join you? Can, can I join you at the block party or in your home or at this event? Can I, can I enter into your life? Can I initiate this relationship and meet you on your own turf? This is what Jesus does for Zacchaeus here, and I think it's what he calls us to as a church, we have to be proactive and, and thinking as we talk about this whole idea of the art of welcoming. Where are the people that God has given me influence in my life and how can I meet them where they're at? What does that look like for me? I think, I think at times I can be so inwardly focused. Maybe this is a, a, uh, a byproduct of working in the church, but I can, I can be so focused about all the great things that we're doing here. And there are so many, and it's so encouraging, and God uses them. But if, if I lose sight, if I begin to neglect the people that God has placed in my life, and I don't have time and capacity and energy in order to, to engage them and to build a relationship with them, invite them into friendship, then perhaps I'm missing something. I'm missing some of the point of what Jesus models for us here because he goes into the home of Zacchaeus and he sits down with him and he eats a meal with them. I love how this, this, by the way, the greatest example of this for us is the incarnation. Where Jesus looks at the condition of mankind and he says, how am I going to restore this relationship? And he doesn't meet us halfway or he doesn't give us instructions about how to get back to God. He takes on flesh and becomes one of us in order to redeem us. The greatest model that we have for meeting people where they're at is what, is what we celebrate at Christmas, where Jesus has, has lived this out in, in perfection. Sometimes we refer to this as incarnational ministry. How can we be where the people are that God has called us to reach? And what does it mean to join them where they're at? If you look back in... Um, Luke chapter 19, verses 8 through 10. Again, this just sort of occurred to me as, as thinking about preparing for this sermon, but it says, And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come into this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Did you notice what happens at the end of this text here? There's transformation and there's impact. Zacchaeus has this grace encounter with Jesus. He experiences what it means to be restored into a relationship with God. And as he does, he's saying, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to return four times everything that I've taken from these people and then I'm going to give away half of what I have to the poor. Look, I mean, think about the kind of immense wealth that he has and that sort of infusion into the poverty-ridden people in that area. Think about the kind of impact that that had. Salvation doesn't come because he does that. He does that because salvation has come. And Jesus gives us this incredible purpose statement. The Son of Man has come to, ser- to seek and to save that which is lost. 
That's what he's about. That's what he's called us to as a church. That's what the neighborhood vision is about. And it's what informs, it, it describes, it shows us what it looks like to be men and women who are, who are about the art of welcoming, who are initiating relationships, who are building genuine friendship so that people can see Jesus alive in us and say they have something. I want that. I want, I want to be a part of that.